let's go to war for colour. If I was going to go to war for anything, I'd go to war for colour. I think we, I think the place is a bit dull. I wouldn't mind a bit more colour. Um, so I said just before the news, you know, I look out a window onto two bland yellow buildings. You know, couldn't they be? Couldn't they be red? I mean, you get a few now. They'll. Uh, I'm thinking sort of. You get, you're starting to get a few giant murals on the side of side of buildings, you know, which I think is terrific, you know, absolutely wonderful. Uh, can look, uh, you know, brighten the place up um, um, immensely. But maybe we should have inject more colour into the world. I've been, I've been intrigued over the years the, 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 the way we've gone from, you know, you used to be able to buy like a two tone car and it'd be sort of like uh, it'd be pink and white, or there were bright yellow cars, you buy a lime green car, you get mustard-coloured cars. You know, and it's, cars were colourful. They are red cars everywhere. Every car is silver. Mm. They're all silver. And I remember when we bought a new car 10 years or so ago, the, the guy going, oh, yeah, you know, uh, silver sells better, sells better secondhand. And I didn't realise until later that possibly it's in the car manufacturer's interest to get us all to drive silver cars so they don't have to bring out this range of green and blue and the like. But anyway, <laughs> Zena O'Connor joins us, Design Research Associates, part of the Colour Collective and basically a colour gorilla. And uh, <laughs> she's joining us to talk about colour in our world. Zena, good afternoon. Good afternoon, James. Thanks, thanks for coming by. What, how do you end up with a sort of love and focus on colour. I suppose when I think about something like design, I would have thought everybody was, but maybe there's colour specialists, you know, they'll talk about painters as being great colourists as though they're interested in colour and so other painters aren't. How are you interested yeah, in colour? Yeah, that's true. Well, I, I started out, I trained as a designer way back last century, um, and way back in <laughs> those days. Um, we would uh, focus on colour as well as focus on design, so we'd spend hours and hours and hours mixing up a very limited palette of colours and create this huge gamut of colour nuances just from red, yellow, blue, black and white. So, right. um, And I, I then worked as a designer for, you know, decades and uh, had the opportunity um, to do a PhD at the University of Sydney and I looked at colour in the built environment. So that's become my my little niche, my little area of uh, specialty. But right. funny you should mention cars and colours. Mm. One of... One of the things that my husband Rory does is uh, count the silver and black cars as we're driving along right. because he's made the obs- observation as well that there are just so many dull coloured cars. Mm, exactly. And, uh, I guess we've, yeah, we've got um, Henry Ford to blame for that because, uh, you know, his famous line was you could, you know, you mm. could buy a Ford um, in any colour you mm. liked provided but, it was black. But that's the, you know, that's the Model T Ford. And then you, but you, if, you, if you're looking at the car fleet of Australia in the 1960s and 70s, they're, they're, they're mustard oh, and yeah. green and blue. And, you know, Absolutely. Holdens came in light blue and, you know, light green and, you know. Also, and now they've gone back to silver, just white, silver, black. silver and, and, and white. And the occasional kind of puke yellow. Now, when you say uh, colour in the built environment, um, mm. you know, rem- removing that out of the academic speech, you sure. just mean houses, buildings. Houses, buildings. City, you know. Yep, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, what I tend to do is I, I'll i do um, evidence-based um, colour options. I'll develop evidence-based colour options for, for large or small buildings, 28-storey buildings in Kent Street or or somebody's residence in Bellevue Hill. Mm. Um, and that's, that's my um, bread and butter. Right. And what does that mean, evidence-based colour options? It's where you don't just pick colours out because, you know, pink is the colour of the day or or the client's wife likes yellow. Mm. It's where you're actually looking at what will work for the site. Um, So you do a colour mapping study. Mm. You'll map the colours in the area. You'll also look at what the client is trying to achieve. So whether they're trying to have their building stand out or whether they want their building to kind of be a little more camouflaged. Right. So you use not just hue but also variations in tonal value and variations in saturation of colour to right. either make the building stand out, be distinctive amongst its uh, neighbours or to colour camouflage the building. Mm. And all those things you just said there, you know, hue and saturation, th- these are how how a designer eye looks at colour. Like, yep. I, I don't, I'm not even quite sure what saturation is. <laughs> so saturation is simply the chromatic intensity. So those yellow dots, uh, sorry, those orange dots on the wall behind mm. you, they're full oh, on saturation. Oh, this is our ABC Radio Sydney orange, yeah, which people exactly. might know. Yeah, yeah, okay. They're full saturation. Right. But then if, um, 
you, you know, a banana will be a kind of a palish yellow, but then you might get a bright VW beetle that's in a very bright, highly saturated yellow. So right. there are variations in saturation. So it's the same chroma. yellow and kind of the amount of the yellow. Exactly. Right, Chromatic right. intensity. And then tone might be, this is actually a different yellow. Well, it might be a lighter version where it's there's perhaps a little bit of white added to the yellow right. or a darker version. So pink, for example, is a lighter version of red. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. But, and so then, but along that spectrum between the red and the pink, there'll be another 20 Absolutely. reds and pinks, right? Six billion. Six yeah. billion. <laughs> is there sort of an infinite, is it almost just what you can see? But it, well, is it a bit like, you know, like um, audio pitch is a... That's a continual spectrum, really, between the, the octaves. Is yes. it the same with colour? Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Um, it's estimated that we can uh, perceive between 1.8 and 10 million different colour nuances. Wow. So no one's actually counted them. It's, it is just an estimate. But, yeah, it would be very similar to, yeah. to what, what you can hear. Yeah. Okay. And so then if we look at colour in the built environment, I would sort of say the same sort of feeling, general observation, that, that our cities are generally dull. Um, we seem to like our houses to be all the same kind of purpley aubergine or something, you know, <laughs> some, that, some, whatever that... Grey aubergine. Grey aubergine, aubergine, that Absolutely. sort of dark yeah. charcoal kind Greenish of... Greenish aubergine. <laughs> Greenish aubergine. Um, standard sort of design is almost to sort of have, to try and make it invisible. It's just going to be a big dark glass with a sort well, of rim of concrete around it or something, you know, these sort of absolutely. things. Absolutely. And that's in fact what prompted me to do, do the PhD in the first place. It was a headline on the cover of the Sydney Morning Herald, which pretty much said, new planning policy coming to Sydney. The idea is to co- colour camouflage buildings down by the harbour. Mm. And I'm thinking, whoa, hang on a minute. What about all of those beautiful little towns in Italy? Mm. Um, what about Greece, where it's kind of bright white. Mm. What about the Opera House? Um, How could you possibly colour camouflage the Mm. Opera House? So, Mm. yeah, I I totally agree. But we also see in in some areas, like you you could think of sort of areas of Sydney where there's lots of terraces and you'll you'll often get a sort of a nice range of colour. You know, you'll get some blue ones and some green ones and people are pinkish ones and things like that. And it, it feels chirpier. Yes, you know, um, we'll look at you know places. I think there's places, plenty of places in Europe might be Amsterdam or somewhere like that, where you've got rows of these sort of brightly coloured absolutely terrace houses, or, you know? or even um, you know in Sweden and, and those darker climates that that spend a fair amount of time under snow. Uh, a lot of the uh, the houses and the buildings will be uh, more brightly coloured. Mm. The saturation will be increased, and and for the very uh, purpose of. In, creating a more cheerful environment. Yeah, Absolutely. yeah, yeah. And so our, both in our houses and then in our skyscrapers, I mean, I was thinking that, that, about that before. We said, oh, it might depend on the colours and the environment. What do you do when you've got four reflective buildings all on the one corner? You know, like yes. If everything's kind of that silver glass sort, sort of look. I mean, we're, we're then sort of denying anybody to make any statement whatsoever, aren't we? Yes, exactly. No one's, no one's game enough to go, no one's game I'm a big to... green building. <laughs> <laughs> or a red building. There was, in fact, a red building at, uh, at North Sydney for quite... No, it was orange, bright orange building mm. at North Sydney for quite a while, the man building, and it really stood out. But, mm. yeah, it unfortunately was... It's now white. Yeah, yeah. So you have a sort of ambition, the Colour Collective and your sort of tactical urban colour campaigns, um, yep. have an ambition to sort of go be aware of colour. Let's let's get some colour back. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, definitely. We're, um, we, we, we did a colour intervention in a, a park at North Sydney <laughs> a couple of years back, which converted some cute little old-fashioned picnic huts, which were very tired and mm. in need of a makeover. And we painted them in very bright colours with a little, simple little pattern to reflect maritime signals. Um, and it's a, it's a funny little story because I put the proposal to North Sydney Council and after a couple of months, I got a call from a gentleman who said, um, look, I can't find a reason to say no to this proposal. <laughs> so I immediately said, well, I'm taking that as a yes. Right. And I haven't said yes, but I can't find a reason to say no. Yes. <laughs> and so we we then worked with a couple of partners, Racine Paints, um, as well as North Sydney Council, who prepped the huts for us. Mm. And we also worked with master painters. Um, and we completely transformed those cute little old-fashioned picnic huts. And now they're bright coloured little picnic huts in a park. So we're looking at doing more colour interventions like that. 
Um, and that by that you, you mean you, you'd look for things and say that doesn't have to be a dull grey block. That's right. It could be painted. We could, Approach yes. owner, council or who, yes, whoever. Yes, exactly. You might have some ones that you want to point out that are desperately in need of colour colour intervention. Our number is 1300 222 702 or you can text to 0467 922 702. I've seen some councils where they'll have a campaign and they seem to often commission artists uh, to, to, to do this, the electricity boxes or the traffic light boxes yes. or those sort of things, you yes. know, whatever those large Fantastic box things idea. are, yeah. uh, will suddenly, you know... Have a makeover. Have a makeover. They'll, be, they'll make some visual pun on, on the area or that exactly. sort of stuff. Exactly, yeah. it, it, it's, it's fun. It's great. Fabulous, fabulous yeah. idea. A couple of um, colour interventions we're hoping to get across the line this year are um, some traffic calming colour interventions, which, um, and there's actually uh, quite a few of these traffic calming colour interventions have been done around the world and they've been kind of trialled and then after the trial they were installed and then after the installation they were, uh, research studies were done to find out if they did in fact calm the traffic and so on. So I've collected all of that research and used it to um, put together a proposal for two similar interventions mm. in Sydney. And where's that? Where would you put them? One is down in McLaughlin Avenue, Rushcutters Bay, which is um, quite a busy road, lots of apartments, lots of local businesses and a little bit of a speed, speed kind of speed demons area. Mm. Um, and because there's no... Uh, crossing, we thought a, a colour intervention here would be perfect because it's so well known as um, a bit of a sort of a speedster place for um, car hoons. Mm. So we thought by uh, putting in a colour intervention there, it, it would be great. It would um, draw attention to the fact that there is a new pedestrian crossing there and hopefully the, the speed demons would slow down a little. And the second is planned for a site just near North Sydney Post Office, um, on the corner of the Pacific Highway. Mm. And that particular area has a lot of workers during the day. Um, there are a couple of schools in the area, so school children. Um, there's also a hotel quite close by. It's a very, very busy location. And there is a pedestrian crossing there already, but because it's such a busy area, having a brightly coloured um, colour intervention there would definitely draw attention. But what are you colouring there? You're colouring... Oh, I beg your pardon, the roadbed. Oh, we're, the road. We're, we're colouring the roadbed. Oh. So we're putting bright coloured designs directly onto the roadbed. Oh, okay. And what is and the theory? Is it, it slows us down because we're sort of looking at it or it changes our perception of the road or... It changes our perception of the road. So quite a few of these roadbed colour interventions have been installed. There's been a couple of uh, installations in... New Zealand, in Chicago, in St. Louis, mm. um, in Europe. Um, and it's they're quite large. They're probably double or triple the size of your av average pedestrian crossing. And because they're brightly coloured, they attract attention, both drivers and pedestrians. Um, the drivers tend to go, oh, I'd better slow down here. This is something I haven't quite seen before. I'd, right. I'll, I'll take it easy here. They still have the um, zebra crossing incorporated but the zebra crossing is um is painted in uh glow in the dark paint so right. it will um obviously light up yeah. at night yeah but um, it's not you then do you then color the road ahead of that you, yes you'd... exactly so about sort of um two three meters to on one side uh, and two three meters the other side right, right i'd like you to do the sort of thing i think is it i never know quite how to say this Trompe Lyol. Oh, yeah. Trompe Lyol. Yeah, Trump Loyal, absolutely. The, yep. the, the trick of the eye. So the driver thinks they're about to drive off into a canyon. <laughs> you know what I mean? So the road the road still stays there, but you know that sort of effect you can do. Like, ah! Now, James, <laughs> that slow everyone down. <laughs> that would probably cause some accidents <laughs> yeah, there. Yeah. <laughs> We've seen, I think it's North Connects, where they've put some coloured lights into the roof and some things yes. along the wall here and there because they believe it's so long we'll get really bored um, and that we, we need to sort of have something have to distract us. to kind distract of entertain away. us, distract could, us, yeah. I could have a lot more colour in a lot more of the tunnels. The tunnels, are, oh, the tunnels to me are horribly finished. Definitely. You know, the, the, yeah. the, the, the finish, like I remember driving, most of them I do the first time I go through them, I go, have they not finished? Yes. It, it, have they not done the walls? You yes. know, I feel like, and so some alternating Ab colour panels, you know. Absolutely. And it's of, also like the pedestrian tunnels as well. There's a pedestrian mm. tunnel um, 
just on Elizabeth Street, I think it's St James Station. And when you come out of the station and walk through the tunnel, it's like you're in the Matrix or something. Yeah. It's just kind of scary. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah long rows of sort of cream tiles. Cream tiles. The central's a bit like that too. Yes. There's a lot of that on that. Conversely, you've got the one, is it from the Domain Car Park through to Hyde Park? Yes. Which has this sort of hilarious old-fashioned history of Australia mural <laughs> <laughs> that's yeah. now totally uh, a little bit uh, a little bit outdated, but <laughs> yes. kind of hilarious and I sort of wanted to stay. <laughs> yeah, definitely. There's there's um, some escalators at King's Cross Station, which has murals on the side, but due to the design of the mm. murals and the angle of the design, you kind of feel like you're falling forward. So you, you kind of need uh, blindfolds for those yeah, yeah. escalators. Nat would like you to take over the uh, Newcastle port with its drab wheat silos and storage areas, could we have a colour intervention? Now, this is an what exciting... A great idea. It, it Wouldn't well, no, it get that sort of scale? Great idea. But, in fact, this is being done on that scale. You think about all oh. every single Australian wheat town and is now ringing up every other every Australian artist going, can you come and do our silos? Absolutely. Well, there's a guy... <laughs> Uh, well, his name isn't Amok Island, but I know him as Amok Island because that's the handle he uses on Instagram. Right. And um, he does those silos mm. and he also does – You, your listeners have probably seen them around. There'll be fabulous large murals of kookaburras or koala bears. Mm. Um, I th- he did the murals on the Canva building in Sydney and he's done some murals – up the Pacific Highway as well. Right. Um, very large scale murals mm. and they're absolutely fantastic and he's yeah. done a few of those silos. What's, what's your view on coloured buildings during Vivid and, um, you know, projections of the Opera House and Look, that sort of stuff? it's great, but, you know, it only lasts lasts for a couple of weeks. Mm. So, And the crowds that it, it draws in, it, uh, just it's, Vivid's just incredible. I kind of figure, why can't we do this on, a, on an ongoing basis? Maybe not quite so you know, wall to wall, but certainly um, on more of an ongoing mm. basis. Well, and other cities are embracing this, aren't they? You know, I'm thinking it's sort of like Hong Kong, Tokyo, that, that kind of city. All of the buildings will be lit. All the buildings have spectacular light displays on them of an evening, you know, stuff, bars going up and down and zigzags <laughs> and, you know, stuff firing off the top, you know. like <laughs> Some of this... them are a little bit over the top and a little too... Uh... But yeah, you think, but you think about, but, but absolutely, yeah. you know, there's a, there's a, you know, perhaps a gaudiness to that sort of stuff. But it's also, it's kind of it's exciting. Lovely. And ours is, is drab. Yeah. And I think a lot of people, would, you know, I miss, I miss the neon yeah. of, you know, that was still present throughout Sydney in say the eighties, you know, up until the eighties, perhaps or the end of the eighties. You know, ne- just a neon fish and chip sign yes, had a great yes. beauty to it. Let alone. The Sharpies Golf one, yeah, you know, the quite that elaborate was a sort of one. yeah, these yeah. elaborate there, William yeah. Street, you know, William totally Street lit the, by neon. Yeah, um, absolutely. You know, yeah. these were these were. That's I mean, there was there was colour through our through our cities, mm. um, which we seem reluctant to have. Like, it, can you think of a corporate client that would say, "Sure, let's have a purple building," you know, like. Go for it. Let's build a, the, the orange. Lots of people say, I remember the orange building in North Sydney that we used to call the Orchie Bottle, um, mm. you know, very fondly. Can you imagine a client now saying, sure, make it, make it. When Atlassian and build up the road here, do you think that, you know, well, Mike Cannon Brooks are going to go, perhaps make not, it blue? <laughs> pat, pat, calling all developers, calling all developers. But yeah, look, it, it would be fabulous. I mean, even if, if it was just one facade of a building or or an installation on one part of a building. It, it, it would be fantastic, mm. definitely. Mm. Yeah. But is there a, there's a conservatism where nobody really wants to do it, right? They, it'll be like, or it'll be like, yeah, that'll be fun, and once it gets to the board or something, maybe we shouldn't. If they, yeah. It'll we'll look frivolous. Well, don't forget our planning policies across Australia have been very conservative as well. The planning policies tend to suggest that we paint our buildings you know, be they residential buildings or commercial buildings, in in colours that harmonise with the environment without actually defining what harmonise yeah. means. Or which or, bits of the environment are still there. <laughs> yes. Or, or colours that are compatible. or, or mm. um, And they tend to prefer more subdued colour palettes, mm. which is unfortunate um, because it has led to a, a bland environment, mm. pretty much mm. a bland environment. It is funny, isn't it? Because I do feel like generationally we go in and out of different relationships with, with colour. Um, you know, I've, I've observed this before, but like, 
your average, my average geography teacher in the 1970s wore a purple body shirt, a sort of, you know, tan <laughs> bomber tan. jacket, big green Mustard flares <laughs> and giant purple shoes, you know, and he, he wasn't considered outlandish. He was no. just a guy teaching geography. <laughs> yeah. like, and so men dressed in, in great colour, I, you know, you, you struggle to see a man outside it, of a blue suit these days. It just the same blue suit. These days. It's yeah. bizarre, isn't it? Uh, yeah, definitely. It's, it's, it's unfortunate. Yeah, it's mm. unfortunate. Mm. And so do you think that, do you, do you hope that that will swing back or do you also then look at colour from a sort of philosophical and societal level as to what it says about us that we're going to represent ourselves in these ways? Yeah, I think, I think on the whole Australia's been a very conservative place for decades and decades. Apart but from the geography teachers in the Apart 1970s. from the geography mm. teachers and, mm. and the occasional band members. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, but it, it, it's certainly changing... Um, in in other countries, definitely, and so it, it's only a matter of time before Sydney and, and other parts of Australia will become a little more uh, positively attuned to to colour interventions mm. in in the built environment. Mm. Yep, yeah, definitely. Yeah. Well, it sounds like a very exciting sort of you know guerrilla gang to be part of <laughs> the uh, the colour interventionists. It's got that sort of. You know, you sound like a movement. Are you, are you a movement? <laughs> oh, we are a movement. Yep, yep. We're on we're on Instagram. So if you want to join our movement, we're the, the oh, colour great. collective. Okay. Um, we've got we've in fact got a um, a colour competition on at the moment mm-hmm. because it's International Colour Day coming up on the twenty first of March. So how oh, is it? The idea is to upload um, an image that features colour. Could be your work. It could be somebody else's work, um, and tag it. Um, ICD Sydney. 2021. Yep. International Colour Day. Okay, International Colour Day. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Mm. So, yeah, so, yeah, join, yeah. join, join the uh, Join the movement. Join the team. Get over the grey. I'll try to resist wearing the black T-shirt every day <laughs> and um, see if we can all do better. So look for the Colour Collective on Instagram is probably the... Colour uh, Collective Sydney, yeah, on the, Instagram. Probably the best place. Grain Corp in Newcastle do light up the silos on occasion in support of community interests or charities. But, yeah, like, imagine if they did it sort of like... You know, a kind of kaleidoscopy stripe that also like confused the eye. You thought it was spinning. You thought it was taking off all the time. You know, like like a color illusion. Like a color illusion. You know, those sort of ones. Where you, or you a know, huge hole in the silo. Yeah. You know, the, the the MCA will have these ones where you go and the the room's full of dots or something, and yes. your whole brain explodes. Yeah. You're like, oh, I can't deal with this. <laughs> so I think that's the sort of uh, that's the sort of one Definitely. that uh, we I'd happily support. Uh, fantastic. So nice to meet you, and thanks so much for coming in. Zena O'Connor is from Design Research. Associates and the Colour Collective. So look for Colour Collective on uh, Instagram. You'll get uh, you'll get all the stuff there up to there.